Hello, this is Aaron, and welcome to part 5 of my uh, 6502 assembly language series. Um, this one is going to follow directly after part 4 uh, with the same code that I worked out on the whiteboard there. So if you haven't watched that one, you may want to check it out uh, before this one. Okay, so what we're looking at here is on the left, the code in an assembler uh, with um, assembler stuff added that I didn't have on the whiteboard. And on the right, we see the code in a machine language monitor on the Commodore 128 um, in an emulator. So on the left, we have a lot more stuff than on the right. The right is, is just basically the code um, disassembled, so you can see the op codes, but it's just strictly the machine code. Um, on the left, um, in the assembler, you can have comments, which start with a semicolon, so you can you know, explain what's going on, which is helpful. You have these two lines up here. The bang two line tells the assembler what to name the, the finished program when it assembles it. And then the star equals line tells it where to start the program in memory. So it's going to assemble it to start at B100 or B00, which is why in the on the right, that's where I started disassembling from. You get more comments, and then you get these um, address labels. So you can label an address in memory or you can label anything really, but you can label an address in memory so that you can refer to it with the label um, rather than having to remember the actual address because sometimes that can get to be a pain trying to remember a lot of addresses while you're writing code. Um, back in the day, um, you know, trying to write code in a, in a machine language monitor, you would generally have to write those things down and so you'd have a note you'd have a notepad by your side to say okay the, the dividend is at fb the divisor is at fc and so on and then as you wrote the code you'd have to put in fb fc um, and those kind of things um, same way with like branches you get to this branch of carry clear you couldn't just say well branch of carry clear to you know, the no SBC loop, you'd have to know, okay, where is that going to be in code? And you might have to keep writing the code and then come back and put that in once you get down to that point and say, okay, that's going to be, um, that's going to be at, B, you know, B19. And so I'll come back, or, or in this case, that's going to be at B1C. And so I'll come back and put B1C in there. Um, a lot of times you would just write the code on paper before even putting it in the computer because it was, you had to work these things out as you go. So you get down to this load A64, and that's where the actual code starts. Everything before that in the assembly program is just for the assembler. There isn't any actual code till you get down to this first opcode, load A64. And if you compare that to the, to the monitor on the right, you can see, okay, there's load A64, store A, FB, which is the dividend location, load A with 9, store that in you know, store A and FC, which is the divisor location, and it just goes on from there. You just have the, you have the same code just turned into machine language and uh, you know, without the labels, just with everything replaced with the actual, the, the actual uh, code, that the, the machine codes that it needs to work. Um, I guess I could explain a little bit in the monitor here, what you're seeing is first the address. So B00 is the first address um, where the program starts. Um, A9 is the actual machine code for load A. So this is a disassembly, which means the monitor takes these machine codes, A964, and says, okay, that means load A64. So if you didn't have a disassembler, if you didn't have a monitor, you wouldn't, you'd even have to just look at this stuff, just A964, and say, okay, that means, you know, I've got to look up A9 in my book, that's load A, and so that means, you know, that means this. Um, having a disassembler is definitely an advantage over just, just having the machine code. All right, so that's the comparison between assembly and just machine code and I, I, you know, I think you can see why assembly is easier. Now one thing I wanted to talk about was um, when you're writing an assembly you have to decide for yourself where everything is going to go, um, where you're going to store things in memory especially. 
Um, with higher level languages, generally that, that's taken care of for you. You just say, you know, I want variable X, and so then the, the compiler decides, okay, X is going to be stored here. It's going to be in the heap, or it's going to be on the stack, or whatever it's going to be. And it just takes care of that for you, and you just call it X, and it is where it is. With assembly, you don't do that, um, or at least you, you typically don't with these... Um, you know, with, with small systems because you can't afford to just have some some memory manager that's taking up a bunch of space for you. So you have to say where things are going to be. Now in this case, I decided, okay, I'm going to put these four va these four values at F, B, F, C, F, D, and F, E. So how did I decide that? Well, you have to know what memory locations are safe and available to use for your program. So the way I do that is I go to the Commodore 128 Programmer's Reference Guide, which is probably a, a requirement, you know, pretty much a requirement if you're going to do this kind of stuff on the 128. Um, and you look at the memory map. And the memory map is just a, a, a location by location map of what's there in memory, what, what every space in memory is being used for. And the first the first page of memory, which is all the ones, that, all the locations that start with zero, 00, is called is called zero page, and it's heavily used because using zero page is faster than using other, the rest of memory, and so the Commodore operating system really uses zero page a lot, and so uh, all these you know, all these locations in zero page have names and have purposes. Now some of them you can get away with using for your own programs if you know that you're not going to call the Commodore routines that use them. Um, like there are a bunch of them that have to do with floating point math. So if you know, you know, if you're writing a game or something like that, you're not going to use any floating point routines, then you can go ahead and use those because you know you're not going to clobber those positions. Um, like here, here's a bunch of floating, floating point stuff. There's FAC stuff in here. And the ones I used, FB and FB through FE, are at the very end of zero page and they're in this section called free zero page reserved for application software from FA to FE. And those are the five locations in zero page that the Commodore engineers said, okay, we won't touch these. We won't touch these five locations. So you, as, a, as an applications programmer, are free to use those for your application. You don't have to worry that you're going to interfere with anything else or that anything in the system is going to interfere with you. So that's why I used those. Um, I could have picked out others that, you know, to be sure, you know, others that aren't going to be messed up while I'm using this. But um, since I only needed four, it just made sense to use those. But if you need more, if you need more space, you might have to go somewhere else and find more space and you might have to go out of zero page which is fine it just means it'll take your it, you know your program will be slightly slower um, my, I'm putting my program at B100 or B00 which the memory map says right here that's the cassette buffer well well I don't have a cassette hooked up to my virtual Commodore and so I will, you know, I'm never going to be loading anything from the cassette. That's cassettes um, for the youngsters. Uh, tape tape cassettes were um, mostly used back in, you know, back in the day for music. But you could also use them on early 8-bit computers in the early 80s. I never had a cassette. Um, I, I had a disk drive right from the start. But basically they preceded um, floppy disk drives. And so you could get programs on cassette, and they were painfully, painfully slow. Um, for one thing, it's a you know a reel-to-reel -reel tape, and so the system would have to roll the tape to the point where the program was, and then start reading it. It couldn't jump tracks. It, it didn't have a head that could move tracks like on a disc. And so cassettes were really slow and phased out as, as soon as people could afford to get disc drives. But anyway, that means that B hundred there is this this space um this 200 256 bytes which you can use and you know be safe as long as you're not going to use a cassette tape and then at c100 and d100 there are these rs 
RS-232 buffers, which you're only going to use if you have a modem hooked up or something like that, which also, again, I'm not doing anything like that. So I know that from B100 up to DFF, I've got free space that I can use. So going back to my program then, if I need more space than I can fit into... Um, then I can fit into um, zero page. I can just go up to a, another space that I know is free, like C, you know, C hundred, C zero zero. My program, obviously, my, I started my program at B hundred, and it's only going up to B twenty one, so it's nowhere near filling up the B block to to run into the C's, and so I can use C the C one the C hundred block. I say hundred, it's not really hundred because it's hexadecimal, it's uh, it's two hundred and fifty six bytes, not hundred bytes, but it's just easiest to say hundred. Okay, so there's currently the C hundred block, which is just empty stuff. So I could use that as my storage. So let's well first of all let's run the program here as it is. Okay, so right now at FB, which is where things are, that's where it's going to store this stuff, is at FB, and that's empty. So now let's run the program, jump to B100, and then check FB again. Okay, now we have some stuff there. So the dividend at FB is now, let's just put these back to where they were so we can see what's, what's going on. Okay, the dividend at FB has been clobbered, it got turned into zero which is just how the how the program works. The divisor is still 9. Remember, I was, I was dividing 100 by 9. The quotient is B, which equals 11, and the remainder is 1. So we divided 100 by 9 and got an answer of 11, remainder 1. All right, so it works. Now, let's check C100 again. Okay, so now let's change this. Let's put the... Div dividend at C100, divisor at CO1, CO2, CO3. All right, and save that. Let's go and assemble that. And, uh, okay, and now I have to, there's a little bit of a process here that I need to simplify, but I haven't got around to it yet. Um, I have to attach the disk and delete the old one write the new one and exit okay back to here I have to attach the new disk all right reload the program oops Keyboard is a little different um, on the old on the old system. I forget where I'm at sometimes. Okay, now let's look at the code and see how it's changed. All right, so now instead of storing A and FB, it's storing into C100. So you can see how changing the labels and the assembler changes the you know the locations used in the code. And now if I run the code and then check C100. It's done the work there. It stored the. It used those memory locations, C100 to CO3. All right. So now I don't have to worry. You know, I have. I have, if I'm going to use that block from starting at C100, um, I don't have to worry about running out of space. All right. And the next thing I wanted to do today um, with this video is let's expand this to be able to divide a larger number. Um, an 8-bit number that only gives you up to 255 and I know you know I'm gonna want to divide larger numbers than that um, in what I've got planned so let's go with larger numbers so first of all I'm gonna write this to a new file 16 by 8 and 16-bit value by a byte and let's store it in div 16 by 8 Okay, I'm just going to do this on the fly here, even though normally I would probably 
kind of figure this out on paper, but all right, a 16-bit dividend then is going to need two spaces, and so we'll start it at C100 and let it have C01 and C02. Then the divisor is still just going to be an 8-bit value, so we'll put it at C02. The quotient will also need to have two spaces, so let's actually let's swap those two. Let's put the two things that need two spaces that have 16 bits, let's put them together. So the dividend will come first, it needs two spaces. The quotient comes second, it needs two. Because if you think about it, if you have a, if you have a big number and you divide it by one, you get a big number, right? So the quotient needs to be able to be as big as the dividend. Then the divisor would be at CO3 and the remainder would be at CO4 because you're, if your divisor is only one byte, then the remainder can't be any larger than one byte. All right, so now we want to store a two byte dividend. So we'll store the same thing, we'll store the same value, 64, which is 100 in, in uh, uh, decimal. We'll store that in dividend and also dividend plus one, which just means the next memory location. So we'll store. Here we're going to store into C100, and here we're going to store into C01. That's what's going on there. Now, if we think about what what our dividend is going to add up to then as a 16-bit value, um, let's do a little Perl real quick. That's going to be 100. Actually, I could figure this out in my head, but 100 times 256 plus another 100, 25,700. Okay, so so our dividend is going to be 25,700, and we're going to divide that again by 9. So what do you get when you divide 25,700 by 9? Twenty-eight fifty-five. So we expect... We want the quotient, we expect the quotient to be 2855. The dividend is going to be 25700. And I'm just adding all these um, comments just, whoops. Um, just to keep track of things and so we can check to make sure that it works at the end. The divisor is going to be 9. And the remainder we would expect to be 5. All right, because that's the modulus of it is five. All right, so we expect our answer to be quotient 2855 and remainder of five. Now, what is 2855 going to look like in hexadecimal? That's the next thing to find out. Uh, print F. B271, B271. Did I get that right? B271, yes. Okay, so that's the quotient we expect to find in memory when we're done. B271 with a remainder of five. And it'll be end at these locations. So, wait a second, this should be four, this should be five. Okay, so we have the dividend is going to be in CO1, COO and CO1. The quotient is going to be in CO2 and CO3. The divisor is CO4 and the remainder is CO5. All right. So we've stored the dividend here. We've stored the divisor. We start the code. We need to store in quotient and quotient plus one because now our quotient is two bytes wide. We need to change this to 16 because we're going. We need to rotate 16 times. This, after we roll the dividend once or shift it, we need to roll dividend plus one to shift both bytes of that. I'm going. I'm not explaining this line by line as I go because I'm just kind of. I'm just kind of trying to show the process. Um, here we need to roll the, the quotient and the quotient plus one. Yeah, that's right, I believe, I hope. Yeah, 
like I said, I'm kind of just doing this on the fly, and then we'll see how it works. Um, that might be all that needs to be changed, because the remainder is still a single byte. We're still doing the work in the accumulator. Think, 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 think. Here we compare to the divisor. We push and then roll the quotient and pull off there. Yeah, I think I think we're good. At least we're good enough for a try. So let's save that. Let's assemble. Uh, loop eight, not six. Okay. We need to attach our disk again. Like I said, this gets this gets old. Right. Write that, exit, come back to the monitor. Whoops. There we go. Load the disk again. The new the new copy of the disk. Okay. Uh, okay. Let's fill let's fill from B hundred to CFF with zeros. And then 16 by 8. Oops. Load that back to the monitor and let's see what we got. All right, so this is our new code. It's a little longer now because we had to add some stuff. But if we go from B100 to B35, that's, that's all of the code, just barely fits in the screen. Um, and if you went through it line by line, you'd see that it matches up to what we have in the in the assembler now. All right, so C100 should still be empty. So let's run the code and see if it works first time. No, it didn't didn't crash and it didn't hang. All right. So at C100, that's where we put the dividend, and it got clobbered zero 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 zero. Because remember that that's taking up two bytes now. And then the quotient we said should be B two seven one, and I got close to that. What did I do? What did I do wrong here? B two seven. What is B two seven? Oh, that's twenty eight fifty five. Oh, I know what I did. Back up here when I did when I printed out my thing, um, it printed B27 and then it put a 1 after it. Why did it put a 1 after it? I'm not sure. Maybe because I was printing out, put out this, this shell puts a 1 if there's an error and that might have been what it was doing there. Let's go back and try that again. Simplify this. Yeah, there we go. It was printing a one because it uh, didn't like something about the way it finished. Anyway, so B27 is the answer we're looking for. Let me fix that here. Zero B27. Let's make it two full bytes. <clears throat> okay, so that equals 2855. And that's what we've got over here. It's in backwards form because I... I'm doing low low byte first and then high byte. Um, there's a word for that right now. It's escaping me, but um, little Indian. Um, and that's Indian, not Indian. Um, when you put the low the low byte first and then the high byte in a multi byte value. So anyway, this is B two seven here. It just shows up as two seven OB. And then we still have the divisor here of nine and the remainder of five stuck where it was. And so I could change these and, you know, I could put these in zero page, I could put them wherever, but it works. Um, let's try, um, well, it works. I was thinking the other day, I thought, what if the divisor is zero? And I actually, I actually started a video based on that because I was thinking, well, if the divisor is zero, the remainder could be really large. And then I got about halfway through and realized you can't divide by zero, dummy, not even with a computer. Um, 
and it doesn't work. That's why you, that's why you're confused. Um, so anyway, uh, that's just kind of a demonstration of you know how you can how you can change a bit of code. And so now I have an eight by eight division routine, and I have a sixteen by eight division routine, and I can you know include both of these in other other code, and then call them. And all I have to do is before I you know before I call them. Put the put the the dividend and the divisor in the locations that you know are specified here in my comments, and then call this div 16 by 8 routine, and you know away it goes, and it puts the answers where I want them. Now there are you know other ways I could do that. I could say okay before passing the values, um, or before calling this routine, you have to put the dividend in the X and Y registers and the divisor in the A register. Um, you can do something like that. And then you could say, okay, and it's going to return the quotient in X and Y and it's going to return the remainder in A. Um, basically, you know, you can you can pass the values in and out of your routines however you want. You just have to know how it's going to be done. You just have to have an understanding between caller and function to say, you know, or caller and subroutine, they're not really functions, but um, you just have to have an understanding, and that's where you, you know, have to have documentation and comments in your code to say this is where these values have to go, so that the routine can find them and use them. All right, so I said now I have two division routines, and you know I can use them. The, the one one that I wanted was I wanted to be able to divide numbers by ten, and so now I can call this routine to do that. Um, and I will probably do a 32-bit version as well. Um, in fact, I could go go ahead and do that really quick um, because it's just going to be an extension of this same concept. Because we're going to have the dividend will then take four spaces. Quotient will take four. And so the divisor will have to start at 8 and the remainder at 9. And then you just have to deal with 4 bytes each time. And there it is. There's your there's your 32-bit version of this program. Now you might another another thought when you're dealing with you know small systems. We only have 64k of memory to work with here. You might say, well, do I really need the 16-bit div you know div division routine? This 32-bit one will take longer. Because it has to it has to do more things. You can see, you know, it's rolling twice as many things here. It's rolling twice as many things here. This routine will take longer, but this would do, you know, this would also do 16-bit values. It would just have more zeros at the beginning of the number. Um, it would also do the 8-bit values. So you could use this to do all your division, and that's one of those things that you know is just going to depend. You have to, you know, you have to make uh, trade-off decisions like that as you're developing and if you if you're writing something that's going to do a lot of division for some reason um, you know if it was, especially with small numbers if it's going to divide lots of small numbers you may want that 8 by 8 routine because it's going to be faster than this 32 by 8 routine um, if you're not going to do that much then you might want to save some space by only having this one division routine so those are the kind of trade-offs you have to think about when you're um, when you're writing this kind of code. And as far as where to put things in memory, that's going to kind of depend on what you're writing. If you're writing a game and, you, and you're going to run your game within like the Commodore operating system, then you can't use memory that the, that the operating system might clobber. If you're writing a replacement operating system, which is what I've, what I've been thinking about doing, um, then you can use whatever spaces you want other than the ones that are actually tied to hardware. Um, then you you know you'd have most of zero page available to you because you're going to replace the the you know the 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 internal operating system you're going to write over that with your own and 
you know, then you don't have to worry about what the what the built-in operating system was going to do with memory. Then you'd need to write your own memory map, basically, and say, you know, here, this, this memory location is going to be for this. Like, maybe I'll set off a certain number of spaces to do math with, and that's, you know, those spaces are going to be available for the math routines only and nothing else. And that way I can make sure my own routines don't clobber each other. You know, or that they don't get clobbered by other applications that I write to run on that operating system then. Um, okay, so that's, I think that's going to be it for today. That's about a half an hour. So that's just an example of taking the code that was on the whiteboard. What, is, what does it look like in an assembler? What does it look like in memory in a, in a monitor without all the extra assembler stuff like labels? And you know what's involved in making changes to it and deciding where you want to put the deciding where you want to put things where you want to put the code and where you want to put your values in memory so hope this has been useful and in the next one i think i'll be moving on to um whatever i'm gonna whatever i'm gonna use this in i'll be writing other routines that'll use these routines that i had in mind for so hope you've enjoyed this and it's been useful to you and thanks for watching.